What makes women fearless? Everything. Women have to be fearless to even try to be the highest level of their profession. Like, you have to be fearless if you think that you're going to be the boss of the company because you know that you're going to have to have so many obstacles along the way because you're a woman. Simply because you're a woman. If you're a black woman, you got more obstacles. If you're a minority woman, you have more obstacles. So what makes WNBA players fearless? We're women. To women of color, to minority women, to all women that want to get into sports, that want to get into entertainment, I think you just have to do it. There's gonna be there's gonna be so many people that tell you, ah, oh, no, you probably shouldn't, or try to like you might be like, hey, I want to be a play by play, and everybody's gonna be like, but most women are sideline reporters or analysts. They're not usually play by play. You need to be like, yeah, but I want to be a play by play. That's what I mean by you just have to decide like if that's what you want to do. You got to do it because there's going to be people that try to put you in whatever normal role is the role for women. You know, like, oh, but women don't typically do that job. Women don't. No, you do what you do. I was born in St. Albans, West Virginia, and raised there as well. So a lot of people get shocked to hear that I'm from West Virginia. They're looking for the accent, which I do have. It's just not as strong as the homie Randy Moss and other people they might know from West Virginia. So yeah, I'm a country bred. I come from a very educated family. My mom was a college professor. My dad was an engineer. I loved it because this is pre-social media. I'm not that old, but it really was pre-social media. So I had we had a lot of land because it's country. So I would be outside playing. I would be running around. So like when I was really young, it was lit. Well, my parents tell me that I first picked up a basketball when I was around four or five. And they said like I was so small that the ball was barely bouncing because I was it was barely dribbling off the ground. But I would say when I can start to remember taking basketball like serious, which sounds crazy, but around eight, I knew that basketball and me had a thing. I started to fall in love with how how good can I get? Like not having, you know, not being six foot and an athlete playing at the professional level. It's, it's difficult because you have to think the game. You have to figure out ways to get what you need to get done without maybe being as tall, as athletic. So I think that my height also helped me learn the game better because I had to know it through and through. Are American men ready for this? I don't know, but if they're not, they better get ready. The WNBA started when I was about 10 or 11. So when I was around that age, there was the 96 Olympics. And it was really crazy because I was watching the Olympic team and we know all those names on that team. That's the first time I can remember there were on Wheaties boxes and all different things where it was celebrating women athletes. I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to high school as a ninth grader and I'm going to be playing with like some legit seniors and then I just like to me that was my fondest memory because there was this anxious energy and then when I got there you know my friends Lisa Lee, Alexis Hornbuckle, they made sure I was good and it was exciting to win a championship my first year. I led my team to three championships. I chose UConn because Coach Ariyama is a character boy, I tell you. Um, he came to West Virginia and, you know, in true coach fashion, he's talking about the airport, he's talking about how small it is. You know, our high school team, we got a lot of recognition, so there were a lot of college coaches that would come through our games to scout us. And then when I saw Coach Ariyama come, you know, he's sitting on Snook and Diddy's couch, which is my parents. And a lot of coaches told me everything I wanted to hear. You're gonna come here, you're gonna start for four years, you know, you can run this team the same way you've been running your high school team. And, you know, and it, was, it sounded good. You know, it sounded great. The thought was, well, I wonder if, every, are you saying that to everyone and will promises not be met? So what Coach Ariyama did, was literally the complete opposite. He was his authentic self as we know him to be. And he came in and he was like, look, we have another point guard that we got the year before. I don't really play favorites in a sense of if you're young and you're good enough, you'll play on my team. It doesn't matter if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. He was like, look, you got talent. We can see that. We want to see how far we can take your potential because we think you have a high ceiling, but that's on you. You know, everything that happens at UConn is on you. And I was like, I like the thought of that. In sports, there's injuries. And when there's injuries in sports, you have a next man up mentality. And so 
Our coaching staff at UConn, we had a couple injuries to the two guard position. So Coach Arama was like, look, you can play the two because you can play the one. And it was just that simple of a conversation to where he was like, you're now our two, get it done. And I was like, all right. <laughs> We're going into my senior year, and everyone knows that UConn is, is basically the standard of excellence. So imagine me getting all excited. I'm leaving West Virginia. I go to UConn, and I don't even win a championship. I'm 0 for 3 at UConn. Like, we have to, it was championship or bust, and we talked about it. We didn't, like, act like it was just going to happen. No, we were like, we have to win a championship. And the best thing about that year to me was the energy that my teammates gave me in a sense of a Tina Charles, a Maya Moore. They took it on their shoulders that they were going to make sure that I didn't leave without one. And that, that to me, was the, the, the best part. When we went into the NCAA tournament undefeated, that was the worst thing in a way because it's like you don't want to go undefeated all season long just to arrive at the final four or the championship and lose your first loss. Like no one cares then. For me, when we won, it was that level of relief. It was excitement. It was a little bit like, oh my gosh, now they gonna kick me out of here. I gotta leave UConn. The goal was to get the seniors a championship and we did that. To be able to be in the record books for the University of Connecticut, knowing who else played for UConn, yeah, it was, it's, it's still humbling. When you look at who I'm beside, it's like they're the homies, but they're also the OGs and the goats. And so it's like, there, there's a feeling it's just hard to describe. Just so people can understand, in, in college sports on the women's side, we had our championship game, and then three days later, I was sitting in New York about to get drafted. So it's not, there's, it's a quick turnaround. We had a parade, we flew back, we, you know, had to pick out an outfit, sign with an agent, you know, and it was, it was a fast turnaround. So when we got back to the draft, I had heard some noise that I could either go one all the way through to 10. And we had a banging class, draft class that year, but I ended up getting drafted number four to the Minnesota Lynx. And that's the team that I won two championships with. So life is funny how it works out. WNBA players typically go overseas in the off season because the WNBA season is in the summer. And so after our season, we usually have about two weeks before we go play overseas. And when I say usually about two weeks, your overseas team will be like, whenever your last game was, you are on the clock, the timer has started, and you have two weeks to report to your destination. My first year I played in Israel, in Israel, like you can go to the grocery store and you can say, hey, where's the lettuce? And they could be like, oh, it's over there. You know, like they can talk to you, no problem. So that was, that's like the easy on ramp for WNBA players. And you know, the nightlife is popping in Israel. It felt comfortable, as comfortable as you could be being in another country. My second year on, I started playing more so in Europe. I played in Russia for five years. I played in Hungary, Lithuania, Turkey. I played in Australia. So you start to tour the world and you start to see the world and see different cultures and you start to see the luxury we have being in America. When initially, when I first got traded, no, I was not ecstatic. In 2011, I was a starter that was an all-star. Imagine you have an all-star year, the best year of your career, and your coach comes to you and says, hey, we love how you're playing, but we would love for you to come off the bench because we think that that would be what was best for the team. Initially, I was like, oh, wait, but why me? Like, you know, there's five starters. Why do I need to come off of the bench? Like something he told me, he was like, you know, you're the one that's gonna handle it the best. You know, I was young, I had high aspirations, so coming off the bench wasn't something that I was like, oh yes, I love it. But then the next year when, when things started, I had to just make my mind up that, all right, you're coming off the bench, whether that was the plan for your career or not, so what you gonna do about it? I ended up winning WNBA Sixth Woman of the Year. I got traded back to the Minnesota Lynx. We won a championship in 2015, and then 2016 we lost to the same team that we had beat the previous year on a buzzer beater. Great for TV, terrible for me. In 2017, we were on a mission. We circled the finals on our calendar. Like, we, we gotta get there. Like, I don't care what we gotta do, we gotta get there. And so then when we did make it to the finals, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird feeling to explain when 
If you set a long-term goal that a lot of things have to go right for that goal to go right, and then you're like, oh, wow, we set the goal and we're here. It was like, it's, it's an exciting feeling. And then we ended up winning um, that year. And I just felt like that was, that was a big moment for me. I got my hair ready <laughs> so that it's still straight. I'm resting. Yeah, we are number one. What I loved about Atlanta was the culture. I loved like when I was there, how it made me feel. I loved the people. I, I was in the thick of things. There was a lot going on and also wanting to post basketball life to be in broadcasting, analysts, the entertainment industry. I knew that Atlanta where is where it's at. Renee Montgomery, guard for the Atlanta Dream, says she's skipping the remainder of the 2020 season to focus on social justice reform. When I was deciding on whether to play in the 2020 WNBA season or not, there were so many things at play. First of all, I had jobs that I had lined up that all got canceled because everything I was doing was in sports. So the women's NCAA tournament that I was going to be calling, that got canceled. The men's 3x3 tournament got canceled. G League got canceled. So those are my actual other jobs in the off season. They're all canceled. So now going into the WNBA season, which would have been the only job I could still actually do during the pandemic, like, you know, I had to make a decision in a sense of it was a financial decision. It was a decision on pro sports. The WNBA only has 144 players. So it's not like you can press pause and be like, all right, I'm back next year. You never know what could happen. I was talking to my family. I was talking to, you know, my snook, my fiance. And I was just trying to figure out what was the best decision for our family. Um, and I was telling them my thought process. And not one person was like, oh, I don't know if you should do that. You know, everybody was like, look, if that's how you feel, do it. And so that that's what empowered me to be like, all right, I'm just going to do it. There's something happening. So I want to be a part of that something. What I was trying to do was trying to do boots on the ground. You know, I had went to the protest and people saw we were giving out waters. OK, what else can we do? You know, we love giving out waters, but like, how can we take this thing to the next level? We still got the steppers on the way, DSSD Studio Steppers. Uh, we got our guys, ATL Drumline in the building. Tell a friend to tell a friend we're about to have a party. The day after I opted out, I threw a Juneteenth pop-up block party in Olympic Centennial Park because we knew that's where the protests were happening. That's where the people would be, so let's just bring the party to the people because there wasn't much to celebrate at that time, but Juneteenth is a holiday that needed to be celebrated, especially at that time. One of the things that we noticed was when we were downtown, we saw that a lot of the homeless community was gravitating to the parks in different areas because that's where waters were being handed out. That's where masks were. So we brought food and fed a large amount of the community there. And that's kind of what lit the fire, the bug. And when it came to the WNBA and what they were doing in the Wubble, I felt connected. I felt like they were doing their thing in the Wubble. We were doing our thing in Atlanta. They were letting me know what was going on. They were reaching out like, hey, we're talking to Senator Warnock right now. We would love for you. You know, like I felt connected. I felt like we were moving as one. That was the best part about the summer of 2020 that not even just WNBA players, but the NBA players, the, the athletes of individual sports. It was like all athletes made a conscious decision that all right, let's try to lead this thing and steer this ship in the right direction. When you talk about social justice and you talk about what we were going through in 2020, I need a mentor. I need help. I needed people to that's been there before. I needed people that understood what was going on to help guide me and lead the way. And I think More Than a Vote was one of those groups that they were like, hey, listen, we see what you're doing. We're doing something similar. Do you want to do what you're doing? And we do what we're doing together. And I was like, what? Yes, like, of course, this is exactly what I wanted to do. Very rarely do you see athletes that are like, yes, politics, we're into it, you know? So it was like, look, we're not all super hype about politics, but we understand that we have to be into politics because as Stacey Abrams told me, politics is into us. Black women, the highest turnout and the most active voting block in the country. I, I understood that when you speak out, when you go against the grain, that people aren't going to enjoy it, but if it's something that needs to be said or if it's something that's on your heart, say it. We're getting going, people. Let's get it going. When I was thinking about retirement and I was thinking about where, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, 
the first thing I wanted to do was be an owner. You know, like it's it's the it's the truth. Like I wanted to be an owner of the WNBA because I wanted to have more of an impact. We kept on talking about, well, how can we take it to the next level? How can we create more change? How can we help more people? And it's crazy because my fiance threw out the idea. I used to say the crazy idea of she's like, well, why don't you why don't you buy the dream? And I looked at her like, what? What are you talking about? Buy the dream, you know? Because as a player, that's something that's just not common. The more I sat and thought about that, the more I was like, you know, that's not a bad idea. I knew one of the things about becoming an owner of a WNBA team is that you can't be a current player. You can't be an active player and an owner at the same time. So if you're going to take yourself serious, I had to take a jump. And I retired. And then I text Kathy, our commissioner, Kathy Engelbert, and I told her, hey, Kathy, um, I'm going to be retiring soon because I'm serious about wanting to become one of the owners of the Atlanta Dream. When LeBron sent that tweet, I was ecstatic because when you have an athlete like that with that much attention talking about, hey, we need to do something for the Atlanta Dream. They need new ownership. And if it needs me to be it, then we're going to have to get that done. I felt empowered. And I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm ready. Like, that kind of just confirmed it for me. That's when we reached out to the More Than a Vote camp and was like, hey, if LeBron's serious, if if everyone's serious, like, let's just figure out how to get things done. Even once the ink had dried, I still was like, is this for real? Like, I, I still was like, I, I couldn't believe it because, like I talked about, I moved to Atlanta way before I played for the Atlanta Dream because I knew Atlanta was my city. I knew that Atlanta was going to be my, my new home. And for me to now be ingrained in that culture, to be a part of it, to be one of the co-owners of the Atlanta Dream, surreal. Right now, we're still making changes to better the organization. That's going to be an ongoing process. We want to rebuild, but with a solid moral foundation. I think that's that's where we're going to where we're going to have a certain, a certain culture in Atlanta that we want to lean into that's going to be community driven. 2020 wasn't just a one time thing. You know, a lot of people thought with the WNBA and the Atlanta Dream that 2020 was the grand finale. You know, 2020 was the beginning. If a topic or an issue needs attention, then we're gonna provide that attention to the topics. And then on the court, we wanna be that team that excels as well because we wanna be one of those teams that is an organization that's hard to pass up on. It's still a little bit crazy that you don't see more athletes that are also owners and also in the front office because like who could run your organization better than somebody that grew up watching it, was a part of it, gave most of their life to it. Like, who else would you want to watch that brand? And so I hope that this starts to become a normal thing that we see athletes going straight to ownership and athletes going to the front office because athletes have the vision. And of course, Renee needs no introduction. Oh, well, hello, Renee what's up, everybody? <laughs> no, like, yeah, well, I would say I'm one third of Think Tank Productions. All three of us, Serena, myself, and VP, we all started Think Tank Productions. So we're excited to talk to you guys. At 34 years old right now, I feel like I have so much energy towards different projects that I want to see come to life. Montgomery & Company is a family podcast that we have that's business and sports because I think it's it's an interesting dynamic to see minority women talking big business, talking sports, and being a part of that big business, you know? We can tell more stories. We can tell dope stories, fun stories, stories that need to be heard, but we can we can do different things with the, with the platform that's now being built. I'm living my dream. Like, I hope people know that. Like, I'm living my dream. I will watch the games for free, but I don't, listen, I'm not giving up my check, but I'm just saying, I will watch the games for free, so I'm just thankful. The keys to my blueprint, I would say, is being authentically me. Throughout my playing career, I took pride in controlling my controllables in a sense of I'm not going to practice late. You're not going to see me with a bad attitude in practice. I'm going to be the same human every single day because that's the things I can control. And so now that I'm no longer a player, I'm going to still be that same athlete just in a different workspace. And so for me, that's, that's the blueprint. Being you is the blueprint because you have something that makes you unique. A lot of people ask me, like, well, how am I so hakuna matata life all the time? And it's like, I choose to be.